So welcome uh, to uh, the European Stroke Organization Conference. Um, and today I'm speaking with uh, Dr. Richard Perry, a consultant neurologist at University College London Hospitals Trust in uh, the UK. Uh, welcome, Richard. Thank you very much. So Richard, really enjoyed your presentation and clearly uh, you've been talking about an extremely important topic. Um, I wondered if you could just outline for us what the concern has been um, about COVID vaccinations and intracranial venous thrombosis. Yes, so um, thank you very much to the committee for inviting me to, to share what we've been doing with you. Um, this really goes back to March, so it's quite a short history. Um, and many of you will have seen reports in the press in early March, um, initially from Austria and Germany and Norway, uh, where uh, the concern was being raised that they were seeing small numbers, but uh, patients with um, very severe clotting in veins in the head and also elsewhere in the body um, and the concern arose because uh, there seemed to be a very tight time relationship with the AstraZeneca virus, uh, uh, adenovector virus based uh, vaccine um, and these were occurring seven to ten days after vaccination and I think the skeptics would still have said yeah but you're talking about four or five cases but they were very extraordinary cases these were individuals who had very severe clotting um, and when the level of the platelets in the blood platelets being an important part of the clotting system was measured um, normal levels are 150 or above and they were down at 10 20 very very low levels of platelets and that's something that normally we don't see in cerebral venous thrombosis. So although the number of cases was not very compelling, the extraordinary phenotype of these cases, I think, led to considerable concern that this was related to the vaccine. Um, and the progress has been very quick since then. Um, we've ended up uh, learning a lot about it. Within weeks, we knew that there was an abnormal um, antibody that was identified in these cases and is very likely to be the uh, pathological mechanism. So it's an autoimmune condition, essentially. Well, thanks, Richard. Um, and you, your uh, study was a, a survey of UK clinicians, uh, really asking them to report uh, the features of intracranial venous thrombosis. Is that about right? Yeah, so... Um, a few of us uh, saw um, very severe cases and um, there was a very quick establishment of um, an email discussion among a very large number of uh, clinicians right across the across the UK. Um, and in parallel with that, the haematologists were very effective at setting up a daily multidisciplinary meeting done through uh, Zoom calls um, and Teams calls um, in which they discussed cases of VIT including other cases, not just cerebral venous thrombosis. And but so if um, don't know what VIT is, perhaps... Um... Indeed. So um, this is the name that's been given to the syndrome that I mentioned, um, very severe venous thrombosis in association with very low uh, platelets in the blood. So it's, a, it's now recognised as a, as a syndrome in its own right. It's also been called VIPIT. Um, and in America, they prefer the terminology TTS. So because it's so new, the, the terminology hasn't really settled down quite yet. So how did you do your study? Um, did, were people uh, coming to you with cases or were you reminding them every week or how was it done? So um, because this was all set up uh, very rapidly, um, we it wasn't done in an incredibly systematic way. We, we um, had a very wide uh, trail of emails going across uh, uh, interested clinicians across the UK. We were in conversations with the expert haematology panel who were hearing about cases. Um, and um, later on, we established a link with the MHRA, so we heard about cases through them. Um, the British Association of Stroke Physicians were very helpful in promoting the study um, and giving a, a, a method for reporting. Um, and the Association of British Neurologists also uh, promoted reporting. Um, and we had to sort of draw together lots of different strands into a single unified strategy for the UK. So different people heard about it through different routes, but all of them were invited to submit a standardised case report form, really quite a detailed form, 
um, about the cases that they'd seen. And we were very keen to include not just those that had this very low platelet count, which is the characteristic of VIT, but also any other um, cases of cerebral venous thrombosis that they saw after vaccination. And that proved very helpful, in fact, because they're a very useful control group, the ones that don't have VIT. Okay. So you ask, so so there wasn't much mandating of um, testing or mandating, for example, you know, some of the important clinical features like platelets or anti-platelet factor four or D-dimer. Um, those are done as, as done in clinical practice. That's absolutely right. I mean, it's essential from a regulatory point of view within the UK, because this was being done as a surveillance study, that it was strictly observational and that the data was strictly anonymized um, and uh, to protect you know, patients' uh, identities. Um, we did pretty well, though. I mean, platelets are the crucial thing. And of course, it would be difficult for almost any patient to come through a hospital without having a full blood count, of which measuring the platelets is, is one component. So all of our patients had a platelet count done, and most of them had many, many platelets counts done during their admission. So we were able to take the lowest platelet count as our standard measure. Um, another very important measure of this for this syndrome is, is what's called the D-dimer, which is a, 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 a marker of abnormal clotting in the blood. And this tends to be extremely high in this condition. Um, and D-dimers were done in about 90% of our patients. Most patients who have abnormal venous thrombosis, the clinician is going to think about doing a D-dimer while they're investigating that. So that's not bad reporting. And, 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 and Richard, thinking about time, sorry, you felt um, that uh, you could describe uh, the vis associated intracranial venous thrombosis as a unique or very different, really, from either previously reported intracranial venous thrombosis or other types without this syndrome after vaccination. Is that right? Yes. So, I mean, even those early reports, the cases look very different from what we normally see. And the platelet count is obviously the most striking example of that. Um, but what we were also able to do was to take the whole population of patients who had had vaccination and just measure the, for example, measure the D-dimer uh, um, in all of those patients. And the distribution of D-dimers was very clearly bimodal. So you would have known, even if you'd never heard about BIT, you would know that there appeared to be two populations here, one with the kind of D-dimer levels that we see when somebody has thrombosis, a bit up, but not very high. And then one with spectacularly high D-dimers, which is what is often seen in this syndrome. The platelet count's not quite so clear, but uh, when you use the antibody, these anti-PF4 antibodies that have been mentioned as the marker for VIT, what you see is that they really only occur in uh, in the vast majority of cases in, in patients who have um, uh, a platelet count of less than 150. There are a few important cases where, in fact, the platelet count is with each, strictly within the normal range, so more than 150, and yet they have the abnormal antibody and also very, very high D-dimers. So I think those patients do have BIT. And that's quite an important observation, really, because um, we need to be careful not to rule out BIT in a patient whose uh, platelet count is, say, 158, which was the case for one of the cases that was submitted, um, uh, and not offer them a treatment which we think is probably very effective just because they're just over the threshold for their for their patients. I just wanted to come on to treatment now because um, clearly that's uh, changed over the pandemic as people have learned about different treatment options. Could you just uh, say what you felt was perhaps the best of the options or what have been used most frequently? So again it's a very extraordinary story because up until the 12th of March all of these pet cases were treated the same as we've always treated cerebral venous thrombosis. Um, and pretty much as soon as the haematologists discovered this abnormal antibody, they were out there telling people about it. And in the UK, there was a very effective mechanism for doing that because the expert haematology panel had set up this daily MDT. So they were able to say, well, it's not published yet, but there is this abnormal antibody. And in Germany, uh, there was a, a release, um, a, a public release of information on, I think, the 19th of March, indicating that there was this abnormal antibody. So before the 12th of March, nobody was treated in a different way from normal. After about the 19th of March, the treatment strategy was totally different. So in a week, we went from standard treatment of cerebral venous thrombosis to a completely new strategy. And the completely new strategy had two main components to it. One was to avoid heparins. So in the past, in most venous, venous thrombosis conditions, the most popular blood thinner would be a heparin-based blood thinner, not necessarily traditional heparin, but low molecular heparin, some type of heparin-based drug. Um, and the difficulty with that, or the concern about that, is that the abnormal antibody that happens in VIT 
we also know happens in a condition called HIT, where heparin causes a very similar syndrome. So, of course, the haematologists were thinking, oh, well, if we give heparin to these patients, we might be driving the abnormal antibody process and making the clotting worse. So over the course of that week, uh, we switched over from traditionally tending to use heparin to tending to use non-heparin blood thinners. And because it was an abnormal antibody that was implicated in this, the other uh, new strategy was to try to reduce the level of the antibody using plasma exchange or to reduce the impact of the antibody using intravenous immunoglobulin. And actually, although we can't do a randomized controlled trial, you know, back in March when we were just learning about this condition, when we look at the patients who had intravenous immunoglobulin, look at their outcomes, they were better than the patients who didn't. Now that's not randomised data, so it has to be viewed with caution, but it was quite a big difference. And similarly, if we look at the patients that got heparin and the patients that got non-heparin blood thinners, the ones who got non-heparin blood thinners did better. So on the whole, the data is good support for the strategy that's being used, even though we we don't have randomised control trial data. Well, thank you, Richard. I, I suppose lastly, just to emphasized the importance of a vaccination even with the AstraZeneca vaccine for prevention of COVID and this is an effective vaccine and that the intracranial venous thrombosis are relatively rare is that even that even in younger people is that something you concur with? I think it's an incredibly important message. Um, the UK have been hugely successful uh, in the vaccination programme and uh, this is an extraordinarily rare uh, condition. So your chance of developing this condition if you have your first dose of an AstraZeneca vaccine is probably going to be about 10 per million. So it's an extraordinarily low risk. It's important for us as clinicians to know about it, particularly when the vaccination programme is, 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 is progressing very rapidly because we need to know how to treat it. But in terms of the decision-making process, COVID-19 is a very, very serious disease and anything that can be done to prevent it and to prevent its transmission is extremely important. So I, I can't agree more. It's extremely important that people get their vaccine. Well, thanks, Richard, for a wonderful kind of putting in context of your presentation. And um, so that's uh, goodbye from me, William Whiteley from the University of Edinburgh and Richard Perry from UCL. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>